So I, I promise you, I think, that Greta will not show you any scans, videos of guts, no, nope. no uh, tables. Nope. None of that. <laughs> but I'm delighted that Greta came down again. She, she was, uh, uh, I, I hate to admit it, Greta, but uh, because you're from UCSF, but I think you gave the most popular talk last year. So, you. so you're on the, on, on the stump again. Thank you. Hello. Um, I just want to thank the Caring for Carcinoid Foundation and the Stanford Cancer Center and Dr. Fisher for inviting me back to speak to you about nutrition essentials for neuroendocrine tumor patients, uh, what to eat and why. I'm going to be talking today about some healthy eating basics and then carcinoid syndrome and diet, nutrition strategies for managing diarrhea, and then summary and giving you some resources. So the American Institute for Cancer Research is an organization that studies the effects of food, nutrition, and physical activity on cancer risk and cancer survivors. And so they're a great organization to look to when we're looking for just healthy eating basic guidelines. They recommend that we choose mostly plant foods, limit red meat, and avoid processed meats, be physically active for 30 minutes or more every day, and aim to be a healthy weight throughout life also not smoking or chewing tobacco. So why do they recommend that we choose mostly plant foods? Well, a plant-based diet has not only been linked to a reduced risk of cancer, but also heart disease, obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, Alzheimer's disease, and in cancer survivors, it's been linked to better overall health and improved quality of life. And really, the health benefits come from a whole eating pattern versus one particular food. So yes, blueberries are great for you, but you really want to look at your whole eating pattern and consistency with the diet instead of just sort of, you know, cherry picking, so to speak, one food to, or putting all your eggs in one basket, and really looking at how you can adopt this as a whole um, eating style. A plant-based diet helps us achieve two major goals. One is to increase protective substances that help us optimize our functioning and health, things like vitamins, minerals, dietary fiber, um, and something called phytochemicals, which are plant compounds that give plants color. And then when they eat, we eat them, we get health benefits. So they work as antioxidants, they help boost our immune system, they help to detoxify carcinogens. Um, a plant-based diet also helps us reduce consumption of less health-promoting substances in our foods, like animal fats, animal protein, salt, sugar, food additives, and preservatives. So a very basic, easy way for you to evaluate your diet and see if you're on the right track is just to look at your plate. And if your plate looks similar to the one that you see in this picture, where two-thirds or more are coming from plant foods, vegetables, fruits, grains, beans, and a third or less is coming from animal foods, you know, meat, chicken, fish, or dairy products, you're definitely on the right track, and that's what we would consider a plant-based diet. I just want to highlight um, cold water fish. It's not a plant food, but it, it's particularly a healthy food to include in the diet. Examples of cold water fish are salmon, trout, herring, sable fish, sardines, and mackerel. Not only are they rich in protein and vitamin D, but they're also rich in omega-3 fatty acids. And omega-3 fatty acids are essential, so we need to get them from our diet. We know they're good for heart health, overall health, for our mood. Um, but in terms of cancer, we also know that they decrease or help suppress something called inflammatory cytokines, which are chemicals that in cancer patients are associated with cancer-related weight loss, um, decreased immune system function, and cancer-related fatigue. So I really urge people to try to consume a cold water fatty fish about twice a week, and four ounces is a little bit larger than a deck of cards. Um, if that's not achievable, I would recommend taking a high quality fish oil supplement to ensure that you are getting adequate omega-3 fatty acids. I also wanna spotlight another nutrient, this is vitamin D. There's a lot of um, press about vitamin D. Pro anytime you pick up a newspaper, there's a new study on vitamin D. And um, that's because we're really discovering that there's a lot of health benefits related to vitamin D. It's important for our immune function, for our normal cell cycle process, for reducing inflammation, muscle strength, and bone health. And studies are also showing that many, if not most Americans, don't have enough vitamin D in their blood. So we don't have adequate levels of vitamin D. 
We get vitamin D when we're out in the sun, we produce it. You can eat vitamin D when you eat fatty fish, eggs, fortified foods, or take dietary supplements of vitamin D. Studies are showing that most adults need somewhere between 800 and 2,000 international units of vitamin D3 per day. Um, and you can have your blood level checked to see if you're at a healthy level, and that's called 25-hydroxy vitamin D um, to determine if you need to take a supplement. And I definitely encourage this for any patients that have chronic diarrhea or fat malabsorption because there's going to be more of a risk for vitamin D deficiency in that situation. So let's talk a little bit about carcinoid syndrome and diet. And I know Dr. Bergslin's going to be talking more about carcinoid syndrome today if you haven't already been hearing about it. But it's a pattern of symptoms which can include flushing, sweating, wheezing, diarrhea, abdominal pain. There's probably some more things on that list. But it's a pattern of symptoms that can happen in a certain number of people with carcinoid tumors. And there's common triggers. So it could be hormone secretions that the tumor is producing. And it can also be certain foods or certain patterns of eating. So if you have symptoms of carcinoid syndrome, diet changes may help. What are the diet changes that I recommend? Well, the first thing I recommend is to recognize that you're a unique individual. So diet and strategies for you really need to be individualized. What works to con help control one person's carcinoid syndrome doesn't necessarily work to control the person sitting next to them. So it's a really good idea if you do have carcinoid syndrome to keep a food and symptom log for a two week period of time. It may really help you to identify certain foods that trigger carcinoid syndrome in you. Um, we have found that there are some common triggers that people with carcinoid syndrome have reported that are more often triggers for them. These are large meals, fatty meals, alcohol, very spicy food, and then foods that contain high amounts of amines. Um, amines are chemicals in food that cause the carcinoid tumors to produce more of the hormones that cause carcinoid syndrome. So what are the foods that are highest in amines that are most likely to trigger carcinoid syndrome? These would be aged fermented foods. So you see up here aged cheeses, alcohol, smoked salted fish and meats yeast extracts, which are actually in a lot of processed foods, so you can look for those on the ingredient list of foods, um, brewer's yeast, and then fermented foods like tofu, miso, and sauerkraut. So these are going to have your highest levels of amines. Then we have foods with moderate amounts. These may trigger carcinoid syndrome or symptoms in some people. This is caffeine, um, colas, coffee, chocolate, especially dark chocolate, um, certain nuts like peanuts, Brazil nuts, coconut, um, avocado, banana, raspberries, and then most other soybean products like soy sauce and tempeh and fava beans. And then we have foods low in amines. So when I, when I talk about what to do, and I recommend that you eat foods low in amines if you're having carcinoid syndrome, these would be good substitutes. So if you're used to eating a salami sandwich, salami is going to be a cured meat, it's going to be high in amines. Choosing roasted turkey potentially will decrease amine intake and potentially decrease some of your carcinoid symptoms. So foods low in amine would be good to focus on. A lot of people come to me and they say, what am I supposed to eat? I'm looking on the internet, I see all these lists of things that they say are good for carcinoid, bad for carcinoid, what do I do? So the first thing is, if you don't have any symptoms of carcinoid syndrome, Focus on eating a healthy diet. Eat a healthy, balanced, plant-based diet. You don't need to take any particular food out of your diet. Um, you just want to focus on eating minimally processed, healthy foods. If you do have symptoms, this is where we can start modifying your diet and potentially helping to manage those symptoms. So first, I would focus on foods low in amines. Um, because large meals is a common trigger, I recommend going away from three large meals a day and moving towards four to six mini meals. Or you could do three small meals and a couple of snacks, but typically that may help. We also want to increase protein intake and niacin intake if you're having carcinoid symptoms. Protein and niacin, which is vitamin B3, um, when the tumor is producing hormones that cause carcinoid syndrome, it's robbing the body of protein and niacin. And this can lead to a protein and niacin deficiency. So it's important to increase your protein about 50% more than what you would normally need. Um, go higher protein with fish, poultry, lean meats, 
um, beans, low-fat dairy, egg, egg whites. Uh, you can also use protein powders like whey protein powder. And then niacin supplementing, but very low dose. This is only 25 to 50 milligrams twice a day. Um, it also, if you're on sandostatin therapy for control of carcinoid tumor, um, it's important to have your vitamin B12, moni B12 um, levels monitored periodically. Also, if you have symptoms, low-fat foods are going to be better tolerated. So you want to focus on low-fat cooking methods, things like steam steaming, baking, poaching, braising, as opposed to frying foods, um, avoiding greasy foods. So think, don't stop, at, don't stop for burgers, don't stop for pizza, go for something a little bit more basic, like a baked chicken sandwich. You're going to tolerate that a lot better. It's less likely to trigger a carcinoid symptom or carcinoid syndrome. We also want to limit added fats, especially added fat, um, animal fats from butter, cheese, chicken skin. Avoid what we call hydrogenated, partially hydrogenated oils or trans fats. And then as tolerated, you do want to include some healthy fats in your diet because you do need fat to absorb fat-soluble vitamins like vitamin A, D, E, and K. And fat is a great source of calories, so in, especially if you're struggling with maintaining your weight. So as tolerated, focus on nuts, olive oil, the fatty fish, um, canola oil as healthy fat sources. And if you're really having a hard time tolerating fat, there's a certain type of fat called medium chain triglycerides, which are actually digested in a different form than other fats, and those may be more well tolerated. Um, you can buy MCT oil in a health food store. Um, you don't cook with it, but you can add it to salads. You can use it in smoothies. Um, and it's naturally found in coconut oil. So you could maybe potentially use coconut oil in your cooking, and you would tolerate that better than other fats. wouldn't tend to trigger as much of a diarrhea or a carcinoid syndrome. So I want to move on to talking specifically a little bit about managing diarrhea because I think nutrition can play a big role in that. And as far as when patients come to see me, that's usually one of the symptoms that they complain the most about is really being distressing and affecting their quality of life. Um, it may be caused by the carcinoid syndrome. It may be caused by treatments or if you've had major intestinal surgeries. Um, there could even be other causes unrelated to the carcinoid tumor that is causing diarrhea. But when diarrhea occurs, um, it's helpful to cut down on foods high in insoluble fiber. Insoluble fiber is found in whole grains, bran cereal, raw fruits, and vegetables. And what insoluble fiber does is it adds bulk to the stool and causes food to pass more quickly through the stomach and the intestines. So if you're eating really high insoluble fiber, lots of raw fruits and vegetables, and you're having diarrhea, it's going to tend to increase the frequency and um, make it more severe. Small portions of these foods or cooked vegetables, vegetable juices and soups and peeled and cooked fruits will be better tolerated. So it's not that you have to cut these foods completely out of your diet, it's just modifying the way you're, you're preparing them or having smaller portions so that you can tolerate little bits of fruits and vegetables because they are still important and you want to still get them in your diet. At the same time with, with diarrhea, it's helpful to increase soluble fiber. Um, soluble fiber is found in oat bran, barley, bananas, applesauce, cooked carrots, and you can use soluble fiber supplements. Benefiber is one example of a fiber supplement that's all soluble fiber. Um, soluble fiber attracts water and turns to a gel during digestion, so this will actually help slow down your digestion and may decrease the frequency of bowel movements. Some other helpful hints, um, for excessive gas, try Beano or Gas-X, which are both over-the-counter and can really help decrease gas. Um, experiment with um, eliminating lactose. Oftentimes diarrhea may be because of lactose intolerance or difficulty digesting the carbohydrate and dairy products. So you can try cutting out dairy or cutting way down on dairy or using lactate pills which help you digest dairy to decrease gas, bloating, and diarrhea. Also limit high sugar foods. Sugar, high sugar foods can trigger diarrhea as well. Um, so that would be you know rich desserts, ice cream, things like that. Even fruit juice, which is really a pretty concentrated source of sugar, may be more well tolerated if you dilute it with water half and half. 
A couple other helpful hints, because um, we need a lot of different strategies to manage this. Um, fresh ground nutmeg may be helpful. It's just a simple spice that you probably have in your spice jar or spice rack already. Um, probiotics, which are called uh, also known as live active cultures, lactobacillus and bifidobacter. Um, these are normally found in foods like yogurt or kefir, but you can also take them in a supplement form. Um, supplements should be refrigerated and should have at least 2 billion what we call CFUs or colony forming units, and that's the number of bacteria. Potentially they can help decrease gas bloating and help with food digestion. Um, glutamine powder is an amino acid that can be taken. It can help with healing the gut, potentially decreasing diarrhea, especially after a major surgery. And then pancreatic enzymes, which require a prescription, but um, can be used, especially, usually always required after a Whipple surgery, um, and oftentimes with people that are having fat malabsorption, um, which is usually characterized by greasy, foamy, frothy stools or clay-colored stools. Um, and always discuss other medication options with your doctor, um, whether it's different anti-diarrheal medications, um, if, you have your, if you've had your gallbladder removed, potentially using um, medications that bind to bile acids can help control diarrhea. And one thing that I always tell people that I work with is really don't give up on this because you can, usually there's some combination of all these recommendations that will help to decrease your symptoms. You might have to try 10 combinations in 20 different ways, but usually you can get some reduction in your symptoms and that'll help you feel better, um, get more nutrition and you know, have a better quality of life. So keep, keep trying things, don't give up. And lastly, I just wanted to talk, touch really quickly on serotonin in foods because a lot of people come in and they say, well, I got this list from the doctor and they said, don't eat this before I have this test. Does that mean I should never eat these foods? Um, and these are foods that are high in serotonin. Um, they don't cause flushing or diarrhea and they don't fuel growth of the tumor. Um, but what they do do is they influence the, um, the results of the 24-hour 5-HIAA test that is often taken to look at carcinoid tumors. And so it's really important to avoid these foods um, pri 24 hours prior to taking that test. It will help with the accuracy of the test. The foods highest in serotonin are walnuts, pecans, plantain, banana, kiwi, plum, tom and tomatoes. And moderate um, containing serotonin foods are avocados, dates, grapefruit, um, melon, olives, eggplant, Brazil nuts. Most of the nuts actually are gonna have a fair amount of serotonin in them. So just to summarize healthy diet guidelines and, and what you're gonna be shooting for every day, um, you want to look for a balanced diet that has a variety of foods, primarily plant-based, trying to choose fruits and vegetables of intense color. The more color you get, the more health benefits you get. Think about eating from the rainbow as much as you can. A low-fat diet, but we want to include the healthy fat sources, specifically the omega-3 fatty acids and um, the omega-9 fatty acids from olive oil and almonds and avocados as tolerated. Um, choose lean and plant protein sources over fatty meats. Um, limit added sugars. Get adequate fluids, but limit alcohol and caffeine. Be physically active and maintain a healthy weight. And modify the diet as needed to manage the side effects of your treatment or of your carcinoid tumor. Um, some resources. If you're looking for general books to read about uh, nutrition and cancer, um, anti-cancer is, is a good book, um, and foods that fight cancer. Cookbooks, I really love The Cancer Fighting Kitchen by Rebecca Katz, or One Bite at a Time, and there's a few other good re resources up there. And then websites, um, obviously for carcinoid-specific information, Caring for Carcinoid and carcinoid.org are both great resources that have good nutrition information. Um, and then for general cancer information, there's a variety of other websites, American Institute for Cancer Research, Caring for Cancer, cancerrd.com, 
and the UCSF Cancer Resource Center website. We have a lot of podcasts for different nutrition classes that you can watch um, in the comfort of your own home. And if you are taking dietary supplements, Consumer Lab is a good website. They test supplements for purity and potency. So you can go on there and you can look up your supplement and make sure that it doesn't contain lead or that it has the right amount of what you think you're taking in it because unfortunately dietary supplements don't have to really um, they don't have to live up to the same standard as medication. Um, so thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoy your lunch today.